This meeting yes. is being recorded. All right. Okay. Who's here? Yeah, it'll take a minute, maybe. I think Ashley's. George is here. Hi, George. Thank you for being here. I'm here. Ashley's here. Yay. Risha's here. Oh, Sorry, she's finishing up dinner. I will I will be off the stove in a second. Look at that okay. wonderful t-shirt you have. That's gonna be very <laughs> supportive. Paul is here. Yep. We'll wait a few minutes. Before we start. I see that Tony and Nancy are both here. I will just say that we're um, have a couple of things to do for the first 10 or so minutes and then we'll invite you into the room with us. But hello and thank you for being here. Allegra's here. She needs to be moved on to panelist. Okay. Hey, I think you're, are you a co-host? I don't see, oh. I don't see her. Oh, there she is. And Sid's here too. Yep, Sid. All right. Looks like I can do it. All right. <laughs> Oops, I mean, unless that was you who just did that. <laughs> Maybe. All right, uh, uh, Rob, Rob is not here yet. So we're missing Rob. Grover, is Grover going to join us? There's okay. Grover. Okay, Grover's here. So I believe we have quorum. It is 7.02. I, we should start since we have guests and we also know that Sid needs to leave early. So I am calling to order uh, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, for the meeting uh, of today, May 11th, 2023. Um, I welcome everyone and uh, we will start with review of the April minutes. And thank you uh, for uh, completing those April minutes. Does anyone have any additions, corrections, comments with regard to the April minutes? I move to approve. Thank you very much. Uh, who will second that? Second. Thank you. So Paul has moved to approve and Sid has seconded it. Everyone, is there anyone who does not approve this? Or should I just go through a roll call? Okay, Ashley. Oh, you're on mute if you're approving. Yeah, I, I approve it. Definitely. Thank you. Risha. Uh, Carol. Yes. Allegra. Yes. Sid. Yes. Uh, Grover, uh, you are not yet on the trust, but I am. She seeing that no, she is. Oh, at the time of April. These are April minutes. No. Okay, and I um, agree to approve them. Uh, Sid. Sid was a yes and I'm a yes. Yeah, I had said yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. I think we're good. All right, thanks so much. Um, so everyone has agreed to approve them. So we will accept the minutes as they are for April, 2023. Um, so now I will pass this on to Carol. Did we want to welcome Grover first? Yes, uh, we absolutely did want to welcome Grover. <laughs> yeah, welcome Grover. Uh, do you want to stay a minute's worth of, you know, while you're glad to be here, which I assume that you are. So give us a minute or so of you. Sure. Thanks, Carol. Hi, everyone. My name is Grover Weeman Brown, and I've been listening in on your meetings for about a year. And I'm excited to join you because I really 
feel a long-term lifelong investment in making sure everyone has a safe home that they can afford to live in. Um, I experienced homelessness as a young person and as a young adult and have spent many years um, trying to understand how it is that we accept homelessness as a nation and why it keeps growing. And then um, I worked in affordable housing advocacy before my current position uh, in the Oakland area and learned a lot about tax credit, affordable housing development and rental protection law. And now that I'm making Amherst my new forever home, I wanted to make sure that the place my children grow up, I have two children at Fort River Elementary, um, is a place where they see homelessness decrease, not increase in their lifetime. So I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. We're very excited to have you, Grover. And Carol and I will be reaching out to you um, just to welcome you personally and also to give you an orientation um, to the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. So thank you. All right, okay, Carol. And here's Rob. So uh, now the next thing we're gonna do is we invited Tony Morales and Nancy Buffon, if I'm pronouncing her name incorrectly, please help me out. Um, to come and talk to us about, hopefully about UMass, the approach of UMass to housing its students. Kind of a general, the goal here is for us to get more of an understanding of what they're doing and how they're doing and what they see themselves doing. And um, so I'm gonna ask, I see that there's Tony has arrived and uh, I expect that Nancy is on her way. <clears throat> and well, I'm going to turn it over to them to begin by telling us what they want to tell us, and presumably then there'll be a little bit of time for questions. Um, we can't hear you, Tony. Yeah, I, I just saw that um, I was muted. Uh, sorry about <laughs> that. Um, just two quick things. Nancy's Zoom just crashed as she was invited in as a panelist, so she's going to try to come back in. And then we also have with us Betsy Krakow, who is um, our Assistant Vice Chancellor for Campus Life and Wellbeing. She oversees residential life. So um, if we could- I can invite her and sure, please. There, there she is. So. All right. Thank you all for being here. We look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Yeah, well, well thank you, Carol and Erica, uh, particularly, and all of you for inviting us to come to the Housing Trust meeting today. Um, we know that you do have a lot of questions. Um, not only is housing um, on everyone's mind in this meeting, but it is a topic that is on the minds of uh, many folks throughout uh, the community, including um, us here on campus. So, you know, what we'd like to do today is, you know, talk to you a little bit about some of our approaches uh, as we were asked um, around student housing, what some of our trends look like on campus. Um, and, um, you know, I think, uh, we, you know, happy to answer questions at the end of, you know, our little start here and have just a, we hope a fruitful conversation, um, you know, just to make sure that everyone is, you know, on the same page around uh, housing as it relates to the campus. So I'm going to pass it off to Nancy to uh, give you a few facts and figures um, that I think are important for this conversation. Thanks, Tony, and, and thank you to the Trust for inviting us for this conversation. Um, so just to help kind of, uh, you know, set the tone for where we're coming from, some of the things that we have to think about. Um, so right now we are um, seeing very strong enrollment at UMass Amherst, which you know, it's that's good for the campus, of course, but it's also good for for the community to have a thriving uh, campus here. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, especially, um, I feel funny calling it the post-pandemic era, but because um, I'm not quite sure we're post yet. But you know, as we're in this phase now, the national trend that we're seeing is that flagship institutions like UMass Amherst are enjoying um, strong uh, interest and enrollment from potential students, but um, 
more smaller regional campuses um, are struggling a lot more. And so there's, there's a lot of things that are shifting in higher ed right now, and we're not quite sure where things are going to play out. One of the other things that's on our mind a lot is looking at um, this uh, coming demographic cliff in 2025, where the uh, number of college age prospective students, it's going to drop off quite a bit. So as we're talking about housing, we're talking about enrollment, we've got to look at all of these trends and we have to try and figure out, you know, what are things going to look like for the campus in five years and 10 years and 50 years? Um, and so thinking about what our challenges are now, solutions that we may want to put in place now may not actually help us in the future. So we really got to think through very carefully what this all looks like. So I'm gonna talk very broadly about some of the enrollment numbers and then pass it to, to Betsy who can um, talk much more about housing on campus. Um, in terms of our enrollment, we are currently at, um, for this year's, uh, for the current undergraduate class, we're at 23,146 students who are in person. Um, I know lots of people, uh, we put all of our data out online. So if you go to our institutional research site, you can look at the enrollment you're gonna see a different number. And what I wanna point out on that is that the numbers online also include our online students. And we have thousands of students who the only time they come to campus is for commencement. Um, so it's really important to, when we're talking about issues around housing that we're focusing on that in-person number. In terms of housing on campus, um, since 2006, we have added around 3,500 beds um, on campus. So um, in terms of, uh, our normal housing number um, is around 13,500 beds. There are ways, however, that we can maximize those spaces. Um, and so right now, by converting lounges into um, uh, room, uh, residential hall rooms and taking a room that's a double and making it an economy triple, um, we're able to add more beds. So we are somewhere around 14,300 um, beds right now on campus. We do um, require our freshmen to live on campus and we, we guarantee housing for them. Sophomores are not required to live on campus, but what we have found um, in, in, over the years since we stopped requiring them is that about 80 to 85% of them still live on campus. Um, so the on-campus living is something that is of interest, especially for our, um, our younger students. I'm going to pass it to Becky to let her talk a little bit more about the different options and I think maybe um, some price conversation as well. And at any point, we're happy to take questions too. Thanks, Nancy. And I just would, um, so just to give context in terms of my role at the university as the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Campus Life and Wellbeing, um, I come to this work as a mental health professional, but um, housing is one of the units that I supervise in addition to counseling campus recreation and health education, just to frame my role a little bit. Um, and so this past year, um, with consultation with our governance structures and with our student government in particular, um, in December we, of 2022, um, we moved for the first time uh, to a lottery system for um, those juniors and seniors who might want to remain on campus. So we're looking, as Nancy was suggesting, there's shifting demographics. We don't know what's coming in 2025, but also COVID has shifted things a little bit in terms of uh, the number of students who want to remain on campus. So there was probably an era where, you know, students put in their first year, second year, and then maybe moved off campus. We're seeing increased interest in that communal living and maybe that sort of institutionalized living that um, they may have missed during high school or their earlier years. Um, and so we went to a room selection process where their uh, first year students are guaranteed housing. Transfers can live in community guaranteed housing. And then the juniors and seniors um, get priority in the lottery based on the number of semesters they have lived on campus. Um, and then they're assigned a ran random number based on that because obviously there's a number of students with similar tenure on campus. Um, and so uh, that's the first time for UMass engaging in that process. Um, but we could look at last year and decided that we don't want to be in the position of having promised rooms to students that we weren't able to, uh, what well, we were able to with the Econolodge, but 
Um, and then um, from there, we have active engagement with our Office of Off-Campus Student Life, um, who are running extra advertising, extra uh, roommate matching nights, extra uh, crash courses on how to find housing. And they're keeping tabs on the off-campus rental market for us and um, that there are many price points available in that market and plenty of stock. As far as the options that students have on campus, there's quite a range of accommodations. Um, everything from what we call an economy triple um, that many students um, select this option where uh, there's a standard rate per semester of about $2,882, all the way up to a single room in an apartment, uh, which would be around the $7,000 per semester rate. So that's that's a broad overview. Um, most of the rooms, Southwest, et cetera, are a standard shared room around $3,900. Um, and so, so there's quite a fluctuation whether students choose to live on campus during the breaks or not, changes those rates a little bit. Um, but that's sort of the broadest overview of what's what's happening with campus housing and some of the, the new things that we're seeing both trend-wise and in terms of the process that was passed um, through our SGA this past year. So those rates are per semester, correct? I just wanna make sure I'm getting my facts right. That's correct. Thank you, thank you. They have so, it broken down by month. Like what is the monthly rent even if we could just, I mean, we could do the math, but what's yeah. the lowest rent and what's the highest rent? So, um, you know, this is an estimation because they move in right now on the month, depending on when, when move in uh, rate is. On, on the high end, I think it's in the range, you know, a single, a, a single room, a private room within an apartment in the range of 1,700 a month, somewhere in that range. Um, and on the low end, I get my calculator out, but um, it's uh, much, much less than that. A shared, like a standard shared room is in the range of about $930 a month. So Ashley, I, I just wanted to point out that while we're talking about this in, in, in monthly terms, uh, when a student is with residential life, they're signing a residential life contract for the duration of the school year. It's not a month to month lease like one would see um, either off campus or in our Fieldstone or, or in the Fieldstone apartments, which are on campus, but independently managed. So there is a difference in um, how this contract works. And I'm not so sure it's apples to apples with regard to how we you know, uh, think about rent. I guess the other thing I would say about living in residence, and this is particular to my perspective on it and probably why I'm involved with it, is that um, there's a tremendous amount of programming, hall councils, one-on-one um, -on -one check ins with our first year students, developmental conversations, education. Um, we really see our residence halls as a home for students and a place where um, we're helping them develop along their pathway to independence. So. You, two, two of you have referred to the cliff in 2025 when somehow the students disappear. And I had never heard of that before. Maybe everybody else had, but if somebody could tell me more about where that's from or how you came up, where the, what that, what is that? <clears throat> so the demographic cliff gets referred to a lot in the literature around higher education, um, where the birth rate basically started declining and those students in 2025 are going to start to hit higher education. So there's, there's a lot of universities that are very concerned about um, how that will impact demographics, but Nancy, you might. You know, I was going to say, if I remember correctly, I, I believe that the Northeast in particular gets hit pretty hard where, where the birth rate um, slowed faster in uh, the Northeast than in other parts of the country. So it is, it's even a little bit more um, unknown for, you know, what it'll look like for colleges in, in New England. And Carol, if I, if, if I could point out that that birth rate is tied to the recession of, of the Great Recession of 2008. And that's when uh, we saw a dramatic decrease in um, in births, and that has continued. So, you know, what we're also seeing, I think, you know, with this new trend from that Generation X millennial group in 2008, now with the millennial to generation early gen or late early Generation Zs, I guess is is the right term. There is a birth rate decline there as well. So it is. 
um, something that is continuing and um, something that a lot of demographers, including those of us in higher ed that are really paying attention to. I, I just would, questions. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering if you, I mean, not like ideally you, but also anybody at UMass had data about the impact it has on towns, even other UMasses, which are different towns, but at the the rent price point, and then also who, if I mean, particularly Amherst, the town, the the amount of people in Amherst goes down. What is the impact of more students and the very high rents on the towns UMass is in? Is there anybody that has that data? Ashley, I think the, the data that we have um, is more around our own enrollment trends. And then plus, you know, looking at census data from 2010 to 2020. Um, indeed, you're right, there's been a slight decrease in those that are outside of the um, 18 to 24 demographic um, in Amherst. Um, you know, there are also a lot of reasons for it. We, Nancy and I just recently had a conversation with our colleagues over in the Donahue Institute, which does a lot of uh, census analysis. And along the same lines of the demographic cliff that we're talking about, household sizes have decreased as well. So, so we're seeing a lot of that in Amherst. Um, well, I, I don't want to speak for Amherst. I, I, I looked at it a lot. <laughs> I know you have too. And, and so I want, to, I want to stay out of that because um, that, that is more, uh, you know, we'll, we'll stick to the UMass side of things. But um, we have not, um, you know, we had our um, enrollment trends that, that we had talked about going back to 2010 about raising our student enrollment 3,000 over the course of 10 years. We've hit that mark and we've stayed steady for the last three years, give or take a couple hundred students here or there. We'll see, you know, some slight fluctuations, but, um, you know, our, our numbers have been about 23,000 undergrads for uh, the last three years. And at this point, that is where we're standing. Um, you know, any changes to that, uh, you know, will be certainly mentioned publicly and in the future um, under the next administration. Um, oh, I wonder if I know, um, <clears throat> Betsy, you spoke a moment ago about helping students who don't have on campus housing find housing off campus. And I wonder what you are hearing or have heard about availability and affordability from the students who are trying to do that. It kind of seems to us like we at least hear stories about there being problems. So I wonder what you're seeing. What I can tell you is when we checked in with the um, professionals that work at the off-campus student life office, they are saying that they have availability um, across a number of price points um, in the market. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I know obviously there are expensive options, but they also have some affordable options that are on par with the rates that we're offering um, on campus. So th that's what I can say about that. I don't have specific. Okay. Wait, um, you're I had a couple of hands. Oops. Somebody just said that on par means to you about $900 to $1,000 a, a month. I can get more specifics on the full range of those prices. I don't. I don't have those. Um, but well, I just I'm those like, that you quoted that you quoted were when you're saying you know your rent is about nine hundred to a thousand. So when you're saying there are comparable options, that's like nine hundred to a thousand dollars of rent a month. Something like that, presumably, but that was for something that was a shared room, I think. So, so when Ashley, I want to, I got a couple of other people who have hands. So, Betsy, if you want to say something to that, go ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to see if we can let the other people who want to have a, ask a question ask it. Yeah. I mean, we have lower price points than that available on campus. And I, again, I don't have those data in front of me from off campus. Risha. Hi. Um, so I'm Risha. I grew up here and I also have a kid in the elementary schools. Um, and I'm wondering, I guess I have sort of two questions. One is a follow on on Ashley's and 
um, when they talk about availability and housing, what are, are there specific groups of housing that they are keeping their eye on or how, how do they define what's available? Are you talking about the off-campus housing that we're hearing about? Yeah. Yeah, so our off-campus student life um, lists apartments that uh, are, are coming from rent property managers and landlords throughout the town. So there's a small fee and they list their properties on the off-campus student life website. There's a regular conversation with that office, also with, with Nancy in my office, um, with landlords, just to get a sense of how things are going and, and what uh, occupancy levels look like. Um, there are certain uh, complexes that are, that are, you know, quote unquote, hotter than others that, that, you know, have less vacancy, but there is still vacancy across the board. Um, I also want to remind everyone here, too, that our students uh, do not only live in Amherst, right? So we have better data than we've ever had before on the number of students that are living in the 01002 area code, which also includes my town of Pelham. Um, not many people live there, period. Um, but you know, <laughs> I, I, but it, it does include Pelham. Um, but then we also have students in Sunderland. That that is a, a big area for rentals, um, a, as well as Hadley, uh, Northampton, and Belchertown. So, um, so it is a wide range and we have some statistics, you know, we, we get that information from the landlords and they keep us up to date as we go on. Okay. I mean, that's interesting because it's, we don't hear about lots of affordable availability and, and affordable right. in the sort of general sense, like somewhere around the thousand or lower would, would be um, something we don't hear a lot about. So I, it would be interesting to sort of understand which developers are listing to you um, and if those are listed elsewhere as well. So uh, Risha, I, you know, I, I, can, I can say a couple things based upon ex experience. You know, my, my daughter was a, a, she's been abroad and um, has been studying outside of UMass this, this semester, but uh, um, this year that is, but she's finishing up. I think it depends what you're looking at in terms of um, you know, beds, right? So her, you know, in her situation, there were a number of options that she had that were in about the $700 bed range, right? You know, three three roommates um, in a space. And I think we, we see a lot of that throughout the area. Um, you know, again, the newer units, the newer apartments, the managed apartments are, are generally more, are pricier based upon the data that um, is shared with us. And from, uh, you know, so we, we know that you know, some of the newer apartment buildings are well over that $1,000 threshold. But, um, but you know, there are uh, spaces out there like that that our students are renting and at that rate, that's under $1,000 a bedroom or yeah. a bed, not a bedroom necessarily. The, the other question I had was, I, I couldn't quite do the math quick enough uh, as you guys were talking, but in terms of the percentage of students on campus that are housed on campus, um, do you have those numbers in percentages? I, I, you know, I know it was 23 and 13, and, and but I couldn't quite keep up. Do that fast enough. Uh, Betsy, you're, you're muted, but you have the numbers, right? It's 51. Oh, uh, no, we're, we're at 61, 60, 61 yeah. to 63%. Sorry. And, and has, how has that changed over the last decades? Um, It's yeah. actually gone up. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's held fairly steady. I'm not, I don't know if it went up or not, but it, it's been around there for a while. So, you know, one of our data points, you know, as of, uh, well, I, I'll leave that alone, but yes, we've been, um, we've been at around 61 to 63% for some time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just, if somebody else here has a uh, question that's, uh, we'll take that, but otherwise I see we have an attendee with a question, so I would like to ask Nate to let John Horick speak since he seems to have a question. I, I do. You've spoken largely about undergraduates, but we know that there are several thousand graduate students who come to the Amherst campus, often students from abroad, often students with families. So what are the numbers of those and what's your planning to assure that those people also are accommodated? 
So John, if, if I may, you know, we, we uh, just gave you a quote of 23,146 undergrads. Our total with, uh, with full-time, part-time uh, undergrad, Stockbridge and graduate total is 27,706 this year. About 2,500 of those are full-time graduate students. Then there are people that are, you know, like me, who live in Pelham and will be taking classes uh, this year. So the graduate count is a little bit harder to kind of quantify um, because the conditions are a lot different. Um, and so, you know, I think that when we try to parse the numbers out for everybody, we're really careful in talking about what our in-person population is. And we try to distinguish our full-time population versus our versus part-time because you know situation is different. And we certainly stay away when we talk about these numbers from our online um, numbers, which put us over 30,000 students. But grad students are in person. I mean, whether they go full-time or half-time, I mean, I have grad students that live in my apartment and they go to UMass. So you have 27,000 people coming to UMass physically. Physically, but not all of those is the reason why I distinguish the grad, graduate students from full-time and part-time actually is only because they're not in the same kind of competition for housing in all cases as what we're talking about now. It's just a harder number to really kind of analyze and understand. And I but think they it's are, different for each. But they, they are people who need housing and they go to the physical campus of UMass. And there's about 27,000 people that do that. That is correct. But as I was mentioning, you know, if I'm a graduate student and I have a house that I own and I'm working at UMass and I'm going part time, I also get factored into that count. And so I'm slightly different. I've already had housing and I'm not taking that away in the sense that we're talking about now. Right. I'm not in competition for the resources in the same way. So that's okay. why, again, we, we, we try to be really careful about how we talk about it. It doesn't mean that you're not right to some degree. It also means, though, that not everyone is in that same kind of boat. So, you know, so again, it's just a little bit tricky. It's, you know, counting th this count is very fluid. So if, if I can also right. add, many, many colleges are <clears throat> moving away from even providing housing for graduate students. And so a few years ago when we were looking at our housing stock on campus and, you know, we had Lincoln Apartments, which was primarily graduate students, but not all, um, and also North Village, which was, um, family housing, which it supports mostly graduate students, but also some undergraduate students who, who have dependent family members, it, that we knew that they needed to be replaced. But all of the buildings had long outlived their life. And in many instances at other universities, they would have just knocked it down and been done and not offered any graduate housing. And we, we did not do that. So we are, we will be opening, um, uh, I'm forgetting what the name of it is, but the back building of Fieldstone, Betsy Slate. Slate, thank you, will be uh, for graduate students. I think that's around 200 apartments. And then we have, um, I want to say maybe 150 units over at University Village, which is the family housing. It's my count off 140. 140. Um, so we were able to. Um, provide some housing for graduate students. We know that's not going to house all of our graduate students, but um, we did make that investment. Um, Erica has her hand up. Um, I have a different question, which is around your, if you have data around your employees, including you know faculty and those who work in facility, physical plant uh, in the dining commons, just in terms of uh, where, how long their commute is here and what their sort of average uh, salaries are, because I, I know a lot of people who would like to live in Amherst um, and can't afford it because of all of the pressure that we're just talking about in terms of market rate and um, you know just lack of availability of affordable housing. So I'm just wondering if you have any demographics around that, that might be useful for us as well, because we're looking you know, to increase affordable housing and we're also looking to ensure that especially uh, middle and low income um, people who would like to live in Amherst um, have an opportunity to do so. And that includes the workers here, be it at UMass or at the schools or firefighters. Um, so I'd be interested in demographics for your employees. So 
I don't know. I, we don't, I don't have that off the top of my head. I can tell you that um, Tony was 2013 when we did U3. Yeah, it's a, it's a very long time ago now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, 10 years ago when we partnered with the town um, and uh, brought in U3 advisors to think about ways that we could partner together, um, they calculated that about 24% of faculty and staff lived in Amherst. Um, and that's just broadly faculty and staff. Um, it wasn't broken down any further. And again, that's that's 10 years ago. Um, I, we can find out, um, you know, parking services or UMass Transit may have some information about um, commutes and things like that. So we can look into that. But I'm, I'm glad you, you raised that, um, Erica, because that's something that's really important to us as well. And we're seeing this challenge as we are recruiting faculty and staff and they are looking for places to live um, and to find something that is affordable and where they want it to be and all that. It's been really challenging. Um, and I know we're not alone in that. I'm hearing that from the other colleges. I'm hearing that from friends, like everybody's really struggling with that. So that is a topic that's really important to us as well. And as we think about how we recruit faculty and staff and how we retain them, uh, so. Uh, Grover. I have two very technical questions. One is you mentioned the new grad student housing and the family housing units that the university provides. And so my first question is, what is the average price to rent a total unit, not by bed, but a unit? And do you have occupancy limits for each unit? And if so, what are they? Um, the occupancy limits that were set by the zoning board were um, four people per unit. Um, and I'd have to get you the price on that. And I did not, I have the undergraduate roommates, but I don't have the University of Village rates in front of me. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question, Carol? Yeah, go for it. Um, so you said four people per unit. On average, how many beds, bedrooms are there per unit? I believe- like, Are we talking a one bedroom apartment or like a three bedroom apartment? No, I believe there are two to three bedroom apartments. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The couple of things that you said you could get for us, I'm assuming that you'll somehow get it to us later as we're going through this. Thank you, sure. thank you for that. <clears throat> um, are there, I'm, I guess I have one other question that occurs to me. I'm wondering if the off, I forgot its name, but the off-campus student life department that has, that has uh, rentals available at all these price points, would they be willing to share, to just let us know who the landlords that they're working with or anything, or is that somehow uh, proprietary information or is it available information? It's, it's question. available. It's available, and we can um, actually put the link into the um, uh, into the chat. Well, we don't have a chat, but um, hold on. Campus Student Life UMass. Um, Betsy, do you, I'm just trying to think here. So yeah, here sorry, we are. Sorry, I'll just quickly jump in. I mean, if you go to the off-campus, um, the you know the office, and they have, they have a rental search, so you can. Uh, you know, actually just go in and they list yeah. all, they show all the listings. So you can see right. that, you know, I, I'm, I'm on it right now. So, you know, under $1,100, there's 27 rental unit, 27 rentals available or 27 properties. And you can, you know, see where they are. Um, so, I mean, it is, I think most of it's probably public. It, it's very, it's public. And, uh, okay, and so so, you'd, be, you'd, you'd be able to see it. So, so any, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Let's see what we have, maybe another question or so. Does anybody on the trust have another question or otherwise I will go back, Risha? Hi, uh, hi again. So, I, I mean, I just wanna, this is not a question, this is just a general comment, which is it feels like we've started off like at, at odds somehow. And I, I just wanted to state that while there's clearly tension between the ability to house all the students and the ability to how the, the amount of housing we have in Amherst, I think we're all trying to do the same thing, which is house everybody here, including the students, in yes. affordable ways. Um, and we don't want the students to have 
lack of housing, lack of affordable housing. We know that there's homelessness or houselessness out on campus um, or for people who attend. And so I, I, I just wanted to sort of try to reset the tone because it, we're, we're really curious about how we can align to get housing to all of these people in the best way. Um, and it's it does feel sometimes that, you know, oh my God, there's all these students and they're really skewing all of our demographics. And, and it's a problem, right? Our school enrollments are down and, and I will disagree with what Tony said. And when I looked at the si household size over time of the last 30, 40 years, it hasn't changed that much. Um, what we're really seeing is a dearth of the 20 to 45 year olds um, and all the children they bring with them. So it, it, I don't think there's any easy answers, but I'm really glad to be starting or restarting. It sounds like you've had a conversation 20 some years ago um, and try to figure out how we can get to these goals. Um, if, if I can just thank you for that, that Risha, it, it, like I, I, you know, I, I don't think that we feel today that there was, you know, I mean, I, I know that there's tension within the community for sure around this issue. I, I don't think that we felt that today in this meeting. I think this has been, you know, just really, um, you know, this has been a really good conversation, and I hope, um, I hope our tone reflected that. Um, you know, I, I think there. Um, there are always conversations around this, you know, um, there, uh, you know, Nancy and I meet regularly with Paul, who's, who's, um, I think here, um, at least his name is, um, and, you know, and, and we also meet with Dave Zomack at the same time. Hey, Paul, um, you know, <laughs> it, it's not that we resolve these, these questions because they're, they're such hard things to try to get a resolution to, and they are longer term answers than they are, of course, you know, we, we can't remedy them, unfortunately, just by doing, you know, a, a quick Shazam type of thing, but, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I do, I do think that one of the 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 things that we are a victim of is not only the the university's um, strength and it, and its growth over time, but also that there this place is a, a really wonderful place to live, and people want to live here, um, and that has created you know a lot of uh, you know I think uh, points of. Um, uh, I don't want to say tension, but but it has put pressures on the market, right? And you know, I mean, I think the um, I promised I wouldn't do this, but I'm going to bring it up. The RKG study that goes back to 2015 that I think Rob Crowner probably was was working on it at, at that time um, as part of the planning board. Uh, the you know that is still a very relevant report, and I think that we're also adding into that report now not a mass um, influx of uh, professionals coming from elsewhere, but we are in we're seeing competition for units that might go to students in the past by um, professionals that are, that are leaving cities and able to work remotely because this is a great place to live. So, you know, there's a lot of things here and it, it, it's really complex. And I think this conversation is a great start in my mind. Um, and, you know, one that we're, you know, having with the town regularly and, um, you know, is good to have with you all. I, I Thank guess you. I would Thank you very in, much. Um, Go ahead. Too, that I was having conversation with a colleague this afternoon who came from, I think one of the SUNY schools um, that he said was sort of in the middle of nowhere and they were having the same kinds of issues. Um, so we, you know, we're keeping an eye on the national conversation. I think, I think it's going to require some out of the box creative solutions that are collaborative, collaborative in nature. So, um, you know, we, I think we have to obviously be in partnership about this, but um, I, I welcome your comments about uh, collaboration is probably the only way to get there. So thank you. <clears throat> Well, we're very, we're really grateful for you being here and coming and speaking with us. And I'm, I see two hands and I'm not sure that they, Risha, your hand is back down again. John, do you have another question before we part with our guest? Yeah, I do. I, I know that uh, Risha briefly mentioned the problem of students who simply can't afford to live on campus or even off campus very often, or students who are actually homeless even as they try to attend the university. And I was wondering whether you have information about those problems and whether there's something the university does to try to address it. I know that our Dean of Students Office works individually with a number of students who may be housing insecure or otherwise. Um, we have supply closets, um, case managers, and I'm sure working also with financial aid, but um, that you know that 
that we have had students who live on campus um, and that we do whatever we can to support their success at UMass. Thank you. Um, well, I don't see any other hands anywhere. Ashley, you have some last comment? Just to um, reiterate or just question, like, even if you have to estimate that 900 to 1,000 is per person, and that person could share a room with two with another person or two other people. So that one room generates eighteen hundred or three thousand dollars more or less, even in a two bedroom apartment where there's four people or maybe six. Each person is paying nine hundred to a thousand. True. The around $900 is a shared room. So that's a standard double residence hall room. That's not. So that, okay, so that two bedroom is, is more or less $4,000 or $6,000. Our, our room, our shared rooms house two students. I think we're talking about two different things. And Ashley, we don't have, you know, we, we have some data that's on the off-campus student life uh you know rental search but I, I i can't speak to the data around what rentals are off campus i mean no, again, on campus. a lot of this is anecdotal to me I, I understand what you're saying I, I just i don't think that we have the answers to that no um, on i'm talking about on campus when you rent a room with like even as a freshman your each person is paying that 900 so even like if it's two bedrooms it's approximately four thousand dollars for those four people or maybe six thousand dollars for the six people per in an apartment that is on campus. So our, our normal residential life experience is a one room kind of dormitory style um, housing unit. The other units that uh, Betsy was talking about that were in North apartments are apartment style living. That that's a little bit different. The dormitory, um, you know, uh, that that uh, setup that Betsy was talking about. Um, yes, I suppose you can look at it that way. You know, this is looked at as you know per bed, um, you know, and that's what the costs are. But I'm not sure. You know, I'm I'm getting the gist of it other than the math. So, well, I'm yeah. I the think math, I, the, yeah, I get it. Okay. Okay. All right, then I, I, um, I really want to thank you for coming, and I hope that this is a beginning and not, and not an end. It's a, as, as I said before, it's a problem that's bigger than all of us, and so let's hope that by all trying to see what we can do to help each other, uh, maybe we'll think of something that nobody thought of before that will help. Maybe we won't, but let's keep trying, and thank you very much for being here. If you Thank have any you. last comment you want to make, please do. Thank you. No, yeah, we just appreciate you having us here and, um, you know, perhaps see you again. Great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Uh, let's see. Where are we? I think that means that I am turning it back over to Erica to bring us up to speed on our uh, joint listening session with housing and CSSJC and human rights. And uh, the health department, the Amherst Health Department. Oh, sorry. I knew <laughs> I forgot something. Um, so I would ask uh, Allegra and Ashley to also join me if I um, miss anything. We have been working um, diligently. We've been meeting every week uh, to plan the joint listening session. Um, and uh, it's going to be on June 20th, which is the, the day after Juneteenth. Um, the flyer was in the packet of uh, information that Nate sent out with the agenda and the minutes. Um, if you could uh, share the flyers with all your contacts. Um, Jennifer Moyston's actually creating uh, the flyer to distribute and we have a whole strategy of where we're distributing it. Uh, right now, we're gonna do a wave of the flyer in English because that's what we have. Uh, we wanna translate that minimally in Spanish and then we'll do a second wave uh, where we're also going to be distributing that as well. Um, 
we are probably going to be asking um, maybe some of you to help us. Uh, we're expecting, um, we're very, uh, I think, uh, very ambitious. Where we're expecting at least 80 people. This is an in-person meeting at the Bank Center, 6.30 uh, to 8.30. Um, and uh, we're going to have 10 tables of eight people at each of the tables uh, where on the fly you'll see um, you can ask for child care or, and or uh, interpreter services. Uh, and so um, we're hoping that um, we will have uh, a good showing of individuals uh, who are interested in uh, having us listen. It's a listening session. So the focus really is for us to invite other uh, town, um, either community organizations or town governance organizations and uh, members and representatives to listen. And we really want individuals to come and speak freely about their experience of either trying to find affordable housing here in Amherst, their experience in living in Amherst, uh, and dealing with affordability, rental or permanent in terms of housing. So we're gonna flyer uh, far and wide um, and try to ask as many of the organizations that we're connecting with to really um, try to um, distribute the information and, and get people to come. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to listen and hear from community members, uh, those who live outside of Amherst who want to live in Amherst and those who do live in Amherst and are struggling. Um, and it will give us an opportunity to also then uh, think about what our strategies and what our priorities should be. So um, I'll just ask uh, Ashley and Allegra if there's anything else that I've missed from that. Well, I, I mean, I'm definitely hoping that everybody comes and in fact, like all the town councilors and all the different committees and maybe the land conservation people who have a lot of land and maybe we could get some and anybody that wants to and then we have to write a report and you know that's like a big deal that you know if you go you can certainly chime in on the report i mean let's discuss eventually the report that we're going to collectively write is allegra still here oops oh looks like she might have dropped off. Yeah, I just noticed that right. Okay. Right. Uh, and I think that is a very good uh, point, Ashley. So um, we want to collect the information. We want to actually very quickly turn around the summary of what we heard and then distribute it, put it on our website. Uh, there might be also an opportunity to, uh, if we have um, resources that we can connect with the different aspects of the report, we'll do that as well. But we really want to turn around and give it to um, our community organizations, to town council, to the CRC, and to ourselves to take a look at what comes out of it and then think about action steps. Um, so as we're thinking about, you know, redoing our own strategic plan and our own work with the CRC, this is a great opportunity to, you know, to listen to community members. Um, Nate has also uh, put the flyer on um, our trust website. There's a QR code. So if people um, want to submit comments, there are three major questions that they want to submit comments and can't show up or uh, don't want to show up, but want to submit comments, they can, or they can submit comments and still come uh, and either uh, uh, participate in listening or um, just uh, also participate there. Um, we are, we're hoping that in terms of the breakdown of different tables across the room, that we can generate conversations. And we, as the planning committee, and in, in possibly asking you as well, just be note takers and just listen, but to keep the conversation going by just prompting questions. That's it. Any questions? Um, oh, Nate has a question, maybe. Yeah, no, I was going to say that this will be a posted trust meeting as well as the other boards and committees that are sponsoring it. So, you know, feel free to attend. It will, you know, we are, the report will have minutes, it will have an agenda. Um, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, other boards and committee members will also be there from the other sponsoring ones, but we will need some, some members to probably help out. I mean, if it, you know, optimistic, right? 80, it'd be great. Um, you know, it is in person. Uh, we are getting the flyers out and email every board and committee chairperson. It's going to go home through the school newsletter, um, through other organizations. So it could be that there's a really big turnout. And the idea would be that there could be a follow-up meeting or two. So this would be maybe the first in a series of a few. Uh, so really this isn't, a, you know, this is a chance just to I just want to reiterate what Eric said. We're not responding to, you know, we're hoping that, you know, there's not a panel 
really there's you know tables with discussion points that we're going to report out on and really hear what people are saying and then we can synthesize that data uh, and use it to figure out help you know help figure out priorities and action steps and so it, it kind of aligns with the trust in the CRC meeting. Uh, we have funding to update the housing production plan, which will happen in the fall when the census numbers are finally available. So, you know, I, I feel like all these pieces can come together and really help, you know, create actionable items, and you know, by the end of the year. And so, this is something we haven't done in a long time, really, just to try to hear from different uh, members of the community. So. I just wanted to thank all the people who've been involved in trying to organize it. Um, Eric, Ashley, and Allegra from our group, but I know there's people from various the other town committees. I'm really grateful for the work that's going into putting this together. <clears throat> so if I can just then um, mention who they are, because I think it's important. Um, so we have Nancy Gilbert from the health department. We have Philip Avila and Liz Haygood. Uh, from the Human Rights Commission, Jennifer Moyston, um, who's the, I believe, the DEI um, officer here for Amherst. And Nate has also been very supportive of us as well. And who's from CSSJC? Allegra. Allegra, okay. So she's got two hats on. Go Allegra. <laughs> okay. That's it, back to you, Carol. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so the next thing is this proposal that I would like to make that got tabled last time because there wasn't time. <clears throat> um, and I, the proposal is in my hand somewhere here. It, was, it went out, I think it's sort of simple and straightforward. I would like to propose that the trust um, authorize its chairs to endorse projects and programs or write letters to support as long as the action is consistent with votes already taken on the subject by the trust. <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> this didn't come out of thin air, it came out of twice, once when the town was trying to, uh, had a, a, I think it was a grant proposal they wanted to put in to get money for the, for the, the, the project that they're working on, they asked us to write a letter of support. And it was between meetings and they needed it. And so we decided that, looked back, yes, we supported the project. The trust has voted to support the project. Based on that, I'm going to write the letter. But I felt a little bit like I'm, I would love to officially know that that's okay. And the other time was we were asked to write, to sign on to something to extend uh, the eviction moratorium, which we'd also been in support of before and had a, had even a vote that I could go find in a minute that was in support of it. And so I felt like I, we as chairs could do that. So I would just feel more comfortable as a chair being able to do these things that it seems like you would want done, but I would be grateful if we could pass this proposal. So me and any other chair, whoever is the next chair, I just feel like, yeah, this is this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So that's my pitch. Comments, questions. Can we just vote on it and say it's fine and then go to the next thing, please? Yes, do that. Yeah, we can. That's fine with me. I um, I'm proposed. I first have questions. Yeah, go ahead. Good. <laughs> um, so I'm assuming that the reason that we can't, you can't just send around an email and say, this is the letter, everyone okay with it, is an open meeting problem? Yes. I, it feels like the spirit of the open meeting is not, it, it feels against the spirit of the open meeting because it, what it means is you guys are taking decisions for the whole council. We don't get a say in it. And that, that's the only option we have because we, can't. Know. we meet once a month instead of why can't we meet twice a month and then we'll have twice the conversation. And would it still be something that happened in between? I mean, I may think that would make there be fewer things, but the way that I'm proposing it is only can we do this 
if it's something the trust has already voted in support of. It's a so subjective, I, like you'll be like, oh yeah, it's close. It's sort of like this. I, I mean, it would just, to me, yeah. it would be a lot more comfortable to say, here's the letter we'd like to, to write. If everyone could just write back individually, not to everyone with a okay in the next, you know, as long as you get a quorum, you're good, right? Um, Paul. <laughs> yeah, so that would break the open meeting law. Um, and we don't want to break the open meeting law because that's called sequential um, yeah. deliberation. So you can't, and so and the town has been very strict about complying with the open meeting law, which is a good thing. And it, the open meeting law is to make sure the public sees all the actions that the trust takes. This is to say we delegate to the co-chairs some amount of responsibility. Now, if there's something really urgent, we don't have to have scheduled twice a month meetings. We can The co-chairs can say, with 48 hours notice, we need a meeting. We really need to act. We, we're scheduling a meeting in, in, you know, with 48 hours notice. And so they can, they can call a meeting whenever they feel. What I think the point on this is, is that there are a lot of things like this. It'd be nice to have a letter of support from the trust to get a grant, you know, to support affordable housing. Uh, it's, it's usually not to involve like taking controversial um, positions on a bylaw that's being proposed. And, you know, I think that that's, I think the co-chairs wouldn't be like, do you support this bylaw or not? I think that's something the trust should talk about. But yeah. in terms of like grant applications or things like that, that's my sense of what you're talking about. And if that's the case, I'm comfortable with it. Um, I think by taking positions on sort of town policy things, that's really uh, something that should be a discussion for the trust. Oh yeah. Uh Absolutely. And what what is a quorum? How many people are in a quorum? So if five. you post something, if you post something with forty eight hours notice, you need five of us to show up, take a vote, three or more say yes, and you're done. It doesn't like you. It's like a ten minute thing. In forty eight hours, <laughs> right? So if it's important, post it. Five people show up take a vote immediately, three people say, yes, we're done. Like, right? It was sort of, I mean, if you have to, if it's a letter you have to write, you have to write. I, we could do that. We could do that. It means we have to call more meetings than we maybe want to call. I, I think Rob was trying to say something. So I'm gonna try and shut up for a minute and hear what Rob has to say. Um, yeah, I'd like to support this too. And I, and I think I probably would, but, but my concern is that um, it's open-ended and it implies that it, it, it could be a vote taken years ago with a completely different um, membership. So, so, which, you know, it's likely that the membership would continue to support whatever is being asked, but, but, but you'd be speaking for, for people who are no longer, you know, who no longer made the statement. And it just so I think I would feel a little bit better if um, if there was some sort of time limit on on how far back you could look for a vote or how many members of of the current um, trust were were part of that vote, something like that. But um, it, that, that's my concern. I guess if just thinking of of ease of possibility of doing it, I'd rather have a time limit than have to try to figure out who the trust members were when yeah. it happened. Uh, that, that would, that's Grover. I'm curious if the concerns raised could be addressed as Rob was getting at by just a more specific motion, like um, we'll, like we will approve sign on letters and letters of support for projects. The committee has already discussed and voted in support of within a two year time frame or some you know something like that would that assuage people's concerns well i mean for instance you're totally new but and so like what if what if it was like a month or two ago and you don't want to be on it that's the thing is like maybe it needs to be really very soon like you have two months like Either we voted on something in the last two months and we're all, or we only need a quorum. Like, so we only need three out of five people to say yes. And then if you know that happened, you go ahead.
Uh, Grover, do you still have your hand up or is that left over? If well, you I want to say something, go ahead. Nathan put his hand up. Well, I would just say like, for example, if you, if everyone six months ago voted in support of a project and then I came on and was new and we were going to go vote again, I assume I would lose the vote, but we would still go forward, for example. So it would still be okay with me. I guess it's, I just want to say it's weird to me to think that the something that a different body of people did as a trust somehow doesn't count because now it's a different body of people than it used to be. The trust has some I don't know. I mean, so I don't want to go back forever. I agree. Having a two-year time limit or something is fine. But if it's not exactly the same people, it's still the trust. That's the point. They're trying, we try to, you can only be on the trust for so many years because we want to keep different people being involved in it. So it's, it has a, it is a, an entity and it's not just the people. It's the entity that's doing something. And I will stop there. And Nate. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I see this as an administrative thing that the chair should be able to do because they're not taking a vote on anything. It really is, you know, reiterating what trust has already done through their votes and action. So I think a time frame is fine. But so, for instance, the trust has already supported and voted money for East Gables, you know, 132 North Hampton Road. The trust has done a few things for that. And it could be that next year, Valley is applying for a grant to do something. And they said, will the trust write a letter of support? We need it next week. And although, Ashley, it seems like it could be easy, for whatever reason, it's really hard to get a quorum when you need it. And so I'm not going to, I don't want to place it on, let's try to get five people to meet Thursday morning at 10 a.m., just so the chairs can then preview a letter uh, and then submit it on Friday. And so to me, it's something that the, the co-chairs could say, the trust has done, these are the actions the trust has done in support of this project, and we're in support of this application. And it's not, they're not taking any they're not making any decisions about what the trust is saying now. They're reporting on past actions in support of the project. And so if we needed a new vote, if they really like the trust, we'd like to say that say Valley came back and said, we'd like to add units or change the affordability requirements. To me, that's something that I'd, I'd want the trust to vote on. But if it was like, we're applying for a grant to help subsidize the units to, for a deeper affordability, we'd love the trust to sign in on that. I would say, well, the trust has already taken like three votes on this project. The co-chairs can submit a letter saying, here's what we've done. And if we want to put a time frame, I think that's fine. But to try to, every time to do this, um, it's difficult. So even like with the VFW site, you know, we're looking at sheltering, transitional housing, and the trust will be looking at that. But at some point, we may be like, wow, there's a great opportunity. Sometimes they come pretty quickly. Can the trust write a letter? And so the co-chairs write a letter. If the trust hasn't taken any action, we won't ask that of the trust. But if there's been action on it, then we, we'd ask. I mean, I'm not going to ask the co-chairs to write a letter if the trust hasn't even discussed something. Um, um, I'm not sure how we move forward on this. I would like, I would happily accept uh, something like what Grover suggested as friendly amendments to my proposal at a two year, sometimes projects take so long, maybe two or three years, whatever amount of years would make people be able to say yes because <laughs> okay, i'd like to get you, people to say yes yeah Carol, why, why don't you actually make a motion that we can vote yes or no on uh i move that we uh agree to have the co-chairs be able to endorse projects or programs or write letters of support in in support of projects that the trust has uh, give it, has voted its support of within the last three years. The second and I like, thank you. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, I, let's, I think we have to, uh, Grover has a question and I'm- I, if, I have a friendly <laughs> amendment because if we're writing it out and that becomes the rule, you said projects, I would say projects and policies, because like the eviction moratorium is a policy. Thank you. I accept your friendly amendment. And I as would do, only as do like, I. I would like to ask George, because he's taking notes, if he uh, would like to try to read back whatever it is that we're voting on. 
he can't read it back at the moment um, because you need to restate it at least one more time, a little bit more slowly. Um, and then yeah, I, I know it was, it was, it's changed a few times in the last 30, 40 seconds. So we take your time and I will try to write it down and then I will read it back and hopefully we'll get it right. But at the moment, I can't do it. Okay. Uh, that the Amnesty Municipal Affordable Housing Trust authorizes its chairs to endorse projects or policies or to write letters of support as slow, long slow, as- Slow, 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 slow. sorry. I'm not- I am not a professional. This is, please. Uh, so start again. I'm sorry. I'm just, if I'm I don't sorry. keep going, I'll forget what I'm I saying. Know, so I know, I understand, <laughs> but I, I can't go that fast. I got it. So tell me where you are. Start again at the beginning, please. The Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust authorizes its chairs. Keep going, great. To endorse projects or policies or write letters of support Good. So long as such action is consistent with votes taken by the trust within the last three years. So what I have is that the Amherst Municipal Affording Housing Trust authorized its co-chairs to endorse projects or policies or write letters of support so long as such action is consistent with votes taken by the trust within the last three years. Yeah, I just put, I put chair and then with the parentheses after it, because I don't know there will always be co-chairs. There we might go back sometime to when I'm, there's only a chair. So it should work for either a chair or co-chairs. So okay, that's thank why. You. All right, I think we got it. I mean, I went, yeah. so. Uh, we should take, an, a, a, it's been seconded, I believe Paul still is seconding it with the, he said he accepted the friendly amendment, we're all good, we should, Erica, how do you vote? I accept, approve. Uh, Rob? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Risha? Did you hear me? Yes. I didn't, I'm sorry, <laughs> thank you. Rover? Yes. Paul. Yes. Who did I? I forgot myself. Yes. Me. Sid. Where did Sid go? Oh, Sid had to leave. Sid told us he had to leave at a certain time, and so he has left. Okay. I think that's that. And um, did, you, did you write the letter already to the um, to UMass about the the like? that you were going last month weren't you writing a letter already did that go out very soon after it did that is the result of that letter is them coming today oh okay we asked and now, in the letter okay. in the letter besides saying you know this seems upsetting that there are so many people who don't we said you know let's let's begin to have a conversation about this will you come to a meeting we offered this meeting and they accepted Okay, well, one other thing is that once you write the letter, can we just get Nate to have the whole letter sent to everybody? So it says, we wrote this letter. Here's your notice that we just sent it. That should, that's not a violation, is it, Paul? That's okay. Yeah, perfect. That's perfectly fine, yeah. As long as there's not okay, a discussion great. about it afterwards. Okay. Great. You just can't talk about it then, right? You can't yeah. talk about it unless you have something to say about it. We'll have to wait till the next meeting to say it, but we can put out what we did. Good point. Thank you very much. That's yes. We'll I, didn't, that. I never know if the letter was sent and then I didn't actually see it. So I, that doesn't mean that it wasn't there. But I'm just saying, like, once the letter is sent, this is the letter we sent. Here it is. Yeah, you're right. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, anything else on this topic? If not, I will pass it back to Erica for something. Updates on also projects. updates. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Ashley, for reminding us that we should have, um, cop uh, we should have sent the letter to everyone else uh, as well. So we still could do that. Um, okay, updates. The first item is um, if there is any update on the housing planner position, 
Um, Nate, would you like to give us an update on that, if you have one? Uh, I, I, I guess I have a, an update. Um, you know, the, the Human Resources Department lost two staff recently, so we're a, a bit understaffed, but the position description, everything is all set. Um, it's under review right now. I think um, I just talked to Dave Zomack and my supervisor about um, just, you know, reviewing it one more time. I'll probably have to go um, possibly to Paul again, but it's, you know, after the last meeting, everything was finalized. And so it's really just, you know, it's going to work. It has to work its way through um, town process to become, you know, a position, but then it's ready to be advertised. So uh, the planning department is still looking for another planner. We're hoping to advertise soon and we'd probably put both of those out together and hopefully have, um, you know, a good response with that. Thank you, Nate. Um, do you think we would have somebody by July 1st? Yeah, I think we can have, well, at least have responses. I, I feel like we can, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, um, then East Gable. Um, so uh, Laura Baker is away until Monday. Um, so we're pursuing setting up a schedule for a tour of East Gable. Um, they've offered that they wanna give us a tour. So we're gonna follow up and um, try to find a time where we can all uh, tour East Gable. I've passed by it a couple of times, it looks really wonderful. And if you look on their website, you can also see uh, the inside of East Gable as well. Um, Ball Lane, um, both Carol and I went to the open house and we got a tour. Um, they um, brought again with them the model which they had brought to uh, Mill River when um, they actually um, came to, I think it was the District 1 um, barbecue and they uh, gave us a tour and went through the whole process. Right now they're working on a development plan for permitting which they're hoping um, that they will submit a comprehensive 40B permit to the town by the summer. Um, and then they also shared, which they shared at um, the open house as well, the frequently asked questions, which Nate put into the packet um, and everyone should have that. Uh, and it also sh gives you a little bit of a design of the project. Um, a lot of people came to the open house uh, and um, I believe uh, that there was a lot of conversation about the support in the community. Uh, I actually live right up um, the street from um, where it's gonna be planned. There are a lot of individuals who came from the community who were really excited about it. Um, they're really, I think there was only one uh, conversation of one person who might not be so excited in terms of being in a butter, but uh, there seems to be a lot of support for that. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, Belchertown Road um, and East Street. I have a long um, update from James, um, so I'll try to condense it a little bit. Uh, it says, we discussed in our working with the town on receiving up to an additional $600,000 of ARPA funds from the town to supplement the CPA funds. That's wonderful news. Um, the LDA is nearly complete. Wayfinder submitted a signed document in the fall and has been working with legal and the town for agreeable ground lease language. Additionally, we're working through some title issues with the attorneys on the sites, but continue to move in the right direction. Belgertown Road sites have been combined by the town into one parcel, which we sort of know. Architectural design continues to be developed and we're wrapping up the schematic design phase and looking to go into design development. Phase one is an environmental site assessment that was completed. The hazmat environmental reports are underway. The traffic studies, geotechnical reports have been received. We anticipate soil evaluation test pits will occur in the next few months. You can see how much goes into um, the development. Our architect, envelope consultant, structural engineer, and geotechnical engineer performed an on-site review of the school and will incorporate the findings into their designs. We received a cost estimate from our construction manager. It appears we're not alone in seeing cost escalation, where we'll continue to move forward with the development and working on funding scenarios that will help mitigate the uptake in costs. With the due diligence work and designs well underway, we anticipate submitting the project eligibility letter application to DHCD this summer to move the 40B process forward with the town and hopefully beginning the meetings in the fall and winter of this year. I just all want right. to say, I just want to say to George, George, we'll forward you the email that that's all in, so you don't yes. have to write it down. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said that, um, and I will do that right. Uh, I will do that after the meeting. Um, then our next is Strong Street. Nate, any any updates on Strong Street? 
No, it's still there. Um, <clears throat> you know, we had um, we had followed up with the state, you know, a long time ago about wetlands and and um, rare and endangered species and habitat. And so we're we're um, we met with the neighbors. Dave and I met with the neighbors uh, in late winter. We haven't touched base with them. Um, it's pretty slow. We're still trying to figure out the best way to move forward with that in terms of how to get some units up there. Uh, but we've been busy with the other projects that you've mentioned. Um, and so Strong Street's still there. I mean, I think it's not gonna yield a lot of units uh, necessarily given, uh, you know, the site constraints. So we, uh, you know, we have some ideas about it. The town may actually act as the developer, which we rarely do, but bring a site plan through permitting uh, just so that it's it's permittable. And it's something that, you know, we think if we put a request for proposal out, we may not get many responses just given that it's so few units. And so, um, you know, it had been in a qualified census tract and Valley had looked at it for something that they then turned their attention to Ball Lane just because it's a much easier site. And so it's no longer in, in a, a qualified census tract. It's across the street. So, you know, there's been some discussion about could we have a waiver or some something to say it's just north of the Strong Street um, and make that eligible for some home ownership funding. Um, but, you know, there hasn't been any, you know, any any other progress other than some, you know, conversations with different stakeholders and organizations seeing how best to move it forward. Thank you, Nate. Um, the other next item is ARPA funding and how the town is any update on how the town's using ARPA specifically for housing, which of course we just uh, found out that there's going to be some support for the Belcher Town Road and East Street. Yeah, I think that was, you know, so when, um, when Wayfinders requested um, Community Preservation Act funding, they also said they would need, or there was a, a requested amount in the discussion during that process in the winter was you know, if it wasn't some CPA funding, then ARPA money could be used to support that project. And so that's something that they've submitted a request to the town that's under review, so 600,000. And the town has committed a million dollars for uh, sheltering and, um, you know, transitional housing. So there's ARPA money going into the VFW site and pre-development uh, work there. Uh, so there's, you know, it's definitely, there's projects that are, you know, they're, they're big ticket items that used ARPA money. There's still some available I don't know exactly how much, but you know, a fair amount of it has been, you know, it could be allocated to housing projects. So if between the VFW site and Wayfinders, you know, there's quite a bit of funding there that would be committed to housing. And is there a plan for that? You said it could be. I know we well, submitted well, the trust. I mean, I, I guess the idea would be, um, you know, if the town we haven't finalized a contract or anything with Wayfinders, but if we do, that's six hundred thousand. For that site and then for the vfw site there's a fair amount that would go into you know pre-development maybe design or other things and so again that's something that staff is working on but it hasn't been finalized in terms of of numbers okay i thought i heard you say that there was still funding available that's designated for housing after the wayfinder her six hundred thousand in the million for our vfw there could be i mean some of it would be you know how much you know we'd have to i'd have to run some numbers, right? There was some money that was made available for family outreach to do some support services that could have been from another pot of money. So someone would be checking with the finance director to say, okay, if all these projects are you know, supported with ARPA, what's the remaining balance? And I, and I could do that if you'd like. Yes, yeah, so if you could do that for the next meeting, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned VFW, anything that, uh, any other updates and any timelines? No, staff is working on uh, you know, the next step would be doing some property assessment, which is underway, and then actually um, we're developing a plan for demolition. Right now, the site is being used to support the construction across the street of the new development. There's, you know, a new project going on across the street, uh, new apartments, mixed use building. And so they're using that for parking. And so right now the site is, you know, is being used to support that. And once that's over, we're looking at you know, cleaning it up and possibly removing the building. Okay. Uh, any update on Hickory Ridge in terms of its use? Uh, we, again, uh, made recommendations about possible affordable housing for uh, elders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the town is still working with Dotson and Flinker or Dotson Associates maybe to come up with a master plan for that. Our focus has been, we have funding to do an accessible trail 
on part of it. And we also have block grant money to do another trail connecting Mill Valley and East Hadley Road neighborhoods through the property to Pomeroy Village intersection. So that's been our focus right now. The town's focus, uh, just the money is has timelines. So there's still um, a process going through to have conceptual ideas for housing or other uses of the site that will be incorporated into a master plan that is still in progress. So you know there hasn't really been anything decided on the site other than uh, some of these trail trail connections. So it's using you know most of the existing cart paths, uh, bridges, and trying to formalize those into you know actually connecting people across the site. Is there a plan um, for once there's sort of a decision made with regard to the next steps, how are you going to engage the community? Because there was a huge initiative, which was wonderful in, in terms of everyone submitting their ideas. And uh, we all got to see what ideas were the biggest ideas, um, but there was really no, I think, response in terms of prioritizing those ideas. Yeah, I, you know, I think we had planned some more public outreach. I'm not sure how that decision-making process will, will occur though. Um, I think, you know, the solar is being installed right now too. So the town has been really busy monitoring that. That's been taking up a lot of conservation staff time. And so, you know, between the, the two trails and the solar, that's what we've been focusing on just to make sure it's all, all done uh, correctly. And then, you know, that, that should be wrapping up uh, by July 1, some of these things. And then I think the report would become more, more polished and, you know, available later for public discussion. Any questions from trust members about uh, any one of these items we just discussed as updates? Not seeing any hands up. Uh, John Hornick has his hand up. Thanks, Erica. Um, I wanted to go back to Strong Street for a moment. When I was chair of the trust as well as a member, I thought that was an important opportunity for the trust. And it looked like we could have at least 30, 35 units, maybe even more that would be built there. But now a best case scenario is probably, I don't know, 14, 15 units, whatever you think, Nate. And the cost per unit is going to be really high. There's a lot of competition for focus on other housing projects. And I'm, again, this is not a criticism of the work that's been done. I do appreciate the work that you and Rob have done, Nate, but I'm wondering whether um, it's no longer worth your time or our time to stay focused on this. I mean, yeah, I'll say, you know, at some point I was somewhat pessimistic myself uh, given the number of units, but, you know, speaking with other staff, you know, it still is town owned property. And so, you know, there's not a lot of other competing uses right now for it. So knowing that it could still be available for housing, even if we permit it as, you know, a six unit, a six parcel subdivision, just to be able to move through that uh, could be important, right? So, it, you know, it may be something that is a slow build out. It could be um, you know, a Habitat for Humanity site, if we can get utilities, you know, at one point, Rob Crowner had mentioned, well, could we sell some of the existing lots to help fund other trust activities? And so, you know, some of it is still really, uh, you know, staff has been busy, but the, the land isn't going away. And so we're still keeping it on the back burner, right? We're still slowly proceeding with it, coming up with ideas. And so actually just the other week, uh, Rob Mora was like, um, we're joking around about playing developer and he's like, well, there is strong street. And uh, um, I think it was after the last trust meeting talking about the cost per unit of development. And we're saying, well, what could, you know, what would it take to fund units there on strong street? And so, you know, I, I agree. I feel like there could be other priorities. And so, but it is something that we're, you know, we're going to keep chipping away at, you know, um, I tell the neighbors to email me every few months with an update as well, just because they're, you know, they're curious to know what's happening uh, in their, you know, in their neighborhood. So, you know, if, if other projects, we're not, it's not like we're precluding ourselves from researching other, other properties or, or, or things, right? So if another property seems like it'd become available and we could act on it, or it's more favorable, we would still, you know, we'd pursue that. But I think, you know, un unless the town wants to dispose of it for some other purpose, which I have, I'm not aware of it, you know, we're still thinking of it for housing, even if it's not a big yield, right? It could be a small homeownership project 
uh, that, you know, could offer, you know, subsidized housing or, you know, something for, you know, 10 to 12 households. Ashley? Hickory Ridge is 10 acres, and that is two tiny house villages of 88 units. We know that those 10 acres are buildable because they have the golf, the actual golf course on it and a parking lot. Why don't we put our energy where we could get 88 units if we wanted it? We have to get the right developer who almost takes no cut, but that person exists and they could do 88 units on 10 acres. Why aren't we doing that? Am I supposed to respond? No, I'm just like, somebody why, could. Why aren't we moving forward with what we can do if we find the right developer with all the 10 acres that we know is buildable? Like, why spend time and energy doing stuff like for months and months and months of no, there's nothing happening on Strong Street. Hickory no, Ridge. So I'm not, I mean, like, I, like I said, though, I'm not spending, you know, so much of my time that it's a drain on on you know my my you know my capacity so you know this will be we have some free time. Hickory Ridge. let's look at it well so we are working on hickory like i said there's been just other priorities on the property and so i think when uh, like i said some of the trail work and solar is moving along then with the you know with the master plan with all the ideas that were uh you know assembled through the engage amherst process that then that will pick up again you know i think the trust still can uh, discuss how housing can be a priority for that site. So I don't, I'm not saying it won't be. I just think that's, you know, the town isn't there yet in that conversation to have that one, you know, that decision making point about what is happening on that property. Well, can we take votes like if something isn't really fruitful in six months or a year, can we vote to drop it and pick up something that could be fruitful and put it on the, bur the front burner? Like, do we have some idea that we could put some things away? If you're not selling it and, and starting on something that could be useful. Uh, we could take a vote like uh, that. Um, right now, I think Paul wants to say something and John had his hand up, but it looks like it's down again, but go ahead, John. I mean, Paul. So, I mean, I think, what the town has been doing is keeping lots of irons in the fire, and that's an okay thing to do. It's like Strong Street isn't taking any time at all. We, 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 you bring it up every month, even though there's nothing that's been done on the previous month, but that's not a bad thing that you keep it on your, because something might happen at some point. It's good to identify that. Um, the VFW site is gonna take a long, it's gonna take years to develop. If you say, let's drop it after a year, we'll never get the supportive housing and, and shelter done, because that's a multi-year, project just to get funding secured because it's a pretty, it's a very big project. Um, you know, on Hickory Ridge, that's not been decided as to what that, that land will be used for. That is a pretty big council discussion to be had. There are many competing demands for that for um, affordable housing, uh, tax pay, you know, um, uh, moderate income housing, um, for a fire station, for a community center, for a senior center, all, all types of things. So how that land is to be disposed is a, is a pretty big decision that hasn't really been uh, put forward yet. So, I mean, the trust should certainly weigh in when that ha when that discussion begins. Um, but I'm just saying that, that there isn't like, let's go build there. That's not an option right now. Well, why isn't it an option? And if we put it on the front burner and took some votes in terms of like, there's a huge need for affordable housing why don't we start building on what we have and we know is buildable and we take some votes about what to prioritize and we know something isn't happening on Strong Street, so we take a vote to deprioritize it. If, if we're talking about Hickory, it's not the trust property. No, it's, it's, no decision has been made on what that property is going to be used for. That's what the planning process is being, is being done right now. So I think the trust should be advocating for using it for affordable housing, if that's what the trust wants to do, but you know, there's nothing. There's nothing. The trust doesn't control that property at this point in time. Does the trust have any property we could 
prioritize over the property that isn't happening? <laughs> Do we have any land? Or... We don't own, the trust doesn't own any land at all. The trust doesn't own any buildings at all. The trust doesn't own anything. We have influence, hopefully, um, but we, we don't own anything. And so the decision-making process for any of these things are, are we are most usually kind of the niggling thing in your side that, or, or if the project gets far enough along, we're the, the advocates. We're the ones who, who go to the meetings and argue for why this should happen, the thing that we want to happen. But it's just, it's not up to us. It's not our decision. So all we can do is keep asking about it in hopes that that keeps the town who owns it and has to decide about it uh, interested in considering housing as a possibility there. I, I think if, if I can jump in, I think it's like a pipeline. Please. You know, we've got some projects that are that are moving forward at different stages. You know, like Belchertown Road and East Street School are, are far, they're already awarded. There's there's contractors. You know, the uh, a different strategy is, is uh, Ball Lane is moving forward. 132 Northampton Road is nearing completion. So we have some nearing completion some in the planning stages, some in the permitting stages, some in early in the, in the stage. And we always, we wanna keep a, a, that pipeline flowing and Strong Street's available there. Um, but we're, you know, I think the staff is always looking at what's the next project, what's the next project and wh where can that be? And, oh, you know, a lot, of, well, a lot of effort has been being put in right now to looking at zoning and rent and different things like that, that will encourage the private sector to be, doing more inclusionary housing as well. Could we take votes on what we think are priorities and what we don't think are priorities, especially like, like, could we have like a hierarchy of what we think is useful and what isn't? We could have mm -hmm. that. We are actually uh, are the joint, the next thing on the agenda perhaps here, is this very important announcement, I think. We're having a joint meeting, the trust, us and the CRC committee next Thursday, um, May 18th at seven. It will be via Zoom and um, it will be a joint meeting. And our goal there is to consider with them what priorities might want to be. So it will be at least for us a conversation about priorities. And I'm it's especially important to know it's coming because we are putting together um, kind of a big packet of material that will be great for everyone to, to uh, read and, can, and think about, not talk to each other about, but think about before we have the meeting on the 18th, which um, Mandy, Joe, Panicky of the CRC has agreed to uh, facilitate the meeting. And we've spent some time a little bit together trying to figure out what the agenda should be, but the but it's it will be kind of for us a, a re, what are the priorities and not just ours because if we just discovered it has to be a conjunction between what's the town's priorities and what's the trust's priorities. We're part of the town and we want we we want to help the town do affordable housing as best as it can. And so, so stay tuned for uh, May 18th. And I'm not sure who's chairing anymore, Erica. I kind of jumped in, but Grover has their hand up. <laughs> Grover, go ahead. Can you please say what the acronym CRC stands for? Community Resource Committee, I think. Yes. And I'm there... sorry. I hate when people do that. So thank you for asking. And I apologize for not saying it all the way out. Uh, and they're the they're part of town council. So uh, this actually, uh, thank you, Ashley, for raising how are we all working together and thinking about affordable housing. And when you think about affordable housing and our own mission 
it's really very expansive from preventing homelessness to looking at um, housing insecurity and security, uh, looking at uh, rental properties, it's looking at home ownership, it's looking at creating more of that. It's really very expansive. And so we have, to some extent, some overlapping mission and goals with the CRC and the town council and the town. So this is an opportunity to really look at all the documentation, the data, uh, the comprehensive plan, and think about what is the CRC's role? What is our role? Uh, where can we fill in gaps that the CRC cannot um, focus on? What's the town's priorities? And really think about our own strategy for the future. So as you said, Ashley, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on and to identify what our priorities should be and what we should be focusing on and maximizing all of the resources and all of the focus that exists in the town, not duplicating it, but that we build off of each other, uh, ensuring that you know we can move forward and, and having an impact on our very large mission, which is to create affordable and secure housing for especially the most vulnerable. I, I think it's also a, a place to advocate for the town to take affordable housing much more seriously and to put it on the front burner to prioritize it over many things that it's not it it's not really on the priority. Like I think we need to like get affordable housing way up on the list of things to think about so that when there's 10 acres, we do something with it. Like we know we're gonna do something with it. It's not even like I don't know who's it's just open 10 acres. Like it's not even a no one's voting on that tomorrow or Monday. Uh, I'm going to uh, let Paul speak, and I just want to um, also recognize that Eliza's had um, Eliza's had the hand up for a while. Uh, but before Paul speaks, just let me state, just uh, in terms of my experience with working with the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust and the town, and also being um, a state worker in terms of you know working within the context of the resources you have. Uh, just from the statement from uh, an update from James, all of the different pieces that have to go into it. So I think, you know, we also have to think about that it would be great if any of us could just pivot, buy and build, but there are just so many different pieces of it. And so I just also want to be um, thoughtful about the fact that there are limited resources. And just from my experience working with Paul and Nate, that they're, they, they are trying as much as possible to do their best. So let me uh, let Paul speak. Yeah, I want to. I just want to push back on Ashley because I think it's unfair, actually, and, and inaccurate to say the town hasn't prioritized affordable housing. The town has done an enormous amount and put an enormous amount of money into affordable housing. The need is limitless. There is not enough. It's not. We don't have enough of the, or the any or that any level of affordable housing. The town council has identified affordable housing as one of its top priorities. It hasn't listed a whole bunch of priorities, but it's one of them. Uh, along with racial equity and sustainability. So, and I think, and just to be totally fair with staff, you know, our staff puts as much time on affordable housing as it does for any other project. Um, it's sort of on par with sustainability uh, in terms of the Nate's office. So I, I you know, I, I hear you saying that often, Ashley, and I think it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a disservice to the people who are advocates for affordable housing. It feels like it's, um, not recognizing the work that's being done. And, um, and so I, I think that um, I, I feel disrespected by that, quite honestly. And, um, and I'm, I think we're always welcoming to be goaded and, and I didn't begin to say, hey, we should be doing more because I think we need that sometimes, especially as public officials. But um, I also think it's okay to say, Nate, you're doing well on these things and good, good for you, so thank you. I, just want, I need to say that to you because I, I see lots of emails coming from you and it, it feels like, um, you know, it, it's, I, I, I just don't feel it's, I, I th you're hitting a lot of really good points when you write the emails. I think you really are identifying key issues, which I really, it has really shaped the public discussion that's happening. So I'm not discouraging you. I want you to keep, you know, not discouraging you from that. I also think it's fair to say that the town, you know, you know, over the course of decades, you know, when John Hornick was leading and, and with the, our co-chairs now and with the staff and with the council, that there's always been a pretty strong priority in town meeting. It's gone back for decades. So, um, 
I just think it, it's okay to recognize that we're doing good work. There's so much more work to be done. Has, has affordable housing Thank ever you. been a capital campaign? Have you had a capital campaign? Certainly, you know, I've only been here like a few years, but is affordable housing ever been part of the capital campaign? Yes, every year. Oh, I mean, in oh, okay. I didn't realize that there's like these capital campaign projects. Well, well I, I guess I don't, maybe I don't know what, what you mean by capital campaign. Well, I thought there was like a specific project that was like the library and the, you know, the this the second the North Amherst additional unit. Those I thought there was a specific thing that was a capital campaign that was like a project. I don't I didn't exactly see that affordable housing was its own capital campaign. Like a project. Um, so yeah, so the town is putting money into Belcher Town Road. Uh, the town's put money into 132 Northampton Road. The town put uh, tax incre increment financing into North uh, North Square, millions, more over a million dollars for that project to make that affordable. Um, so that, uh, there, Nate probably knows more what all the projects have been. So the town has invested heavily into affordable housing to ensure that they would be affordable. And that is called the capital campaign. That's when you well, call. I don't, I don't. Yeah, we don't we don't do capital campaigns, so I'm not sure what that really means. Oh, so I'm. I'm sure. I I'm thought gonna, the library, like I thought, the library was a capital campaign. Like I thought, that's a private. That's a private entity. It's a nonprofit that's doing that. So Ashley, uh, I'm going to ask Grover to speak because we're starting to run out of time. So I'm going to recognize Grover and then Nate, but I would really like to also open up for Eliza, who um, Eliza's had their hand up for a while. Go ahead, Grover. Um, the conversation that's happening here. Um, makes me wonder, I know in previous meetings, I've heard discussion about an ask or a proposal for the trust to have a, I forget what the word is, but like basically like an outlined sense of priorities and goals that we have for say like a five-year plan. And uh, so it just makes me wonder if that is on a future calendar for us to talk about the timing of getting that completed. I'm assuming actually that this meeting we're having next week is part of that process. And it, it just makes me think that, for, you know, this brings up things like, it sounds like we don't have like a public land policy where affordable housing gets a first right of refusal, which is something that is available to, and happens in other cities or, um, a proposal for a countywide bond measure in five years, right? Like there's um, tactics we could take in support that are outside of building guidance, but it would require us to make those decisions and then we would have to pass them through council, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Grover. Um, Nate? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, you know, as part of the meeting next week, there is a, uh, you know, some information that'll go out in terms of town support for housing and different things. So that can help answer some questions. And it's not also just about building units, it's about preserving units, it's about changing zoning and regulation. So there's many things the town does to support affordable housing. So with inclusionary zoning, you know, there's already been 30 or 40 units created through that in the last two years. And so, you know, zoning and land use regulations can also be in support of housing. Uh, housing students is a corollary to affordable housing, right? So the town is engaging in that. So I think the conversation tonight with UMass is also helping with affordable housing. I feel like it's, it is somewhat, um, you know, it's, it's misleading when we say, well, we haven't produced a lot of units that there's so many different pieces that help makes housing affordable and accessible. Um, and then Grover, to your point, yeah, that the, the trust uh, strategic plan was extended for a year. And I think with the meeting coming up and with, you know, hopefully new data with the census coming out, you know, there can be a new five-year plan for the trust. So previously there had been discussions about having, you know, like a subcommittee or two, identifying priorities, short and long-term goals. And so that's available and needs to be updated. And so I agree, it'd be great as part of this conversation, you know, over the next few months, we have priorities. So the planning board is also talking about, you know, how could it rezone village centers? What does it mean for density? There's a zoning proposal right now in terms of certain housing types. But I think there's a lot of discussion right now that can help the trust um, you know, say in the next, by the end of the year, have a new plan for the next five years, right? To have 
okay, how are we working? Um, because, you know, oh, I was gonna say one other thing actually, right? This trust doesn't own land and, I, and it's actually better if the town and the trust as part of the town doesn't own land because once we own it, it's a big process to get rid of it, to dispose of it. And so, as Carol mentioned, I think the trust can be facilitators, can help pre-development and other things, help identify and move projects forward. But to own a project, um, when you say capital campaign, for instance, the town doesn't own affordable housing. So through CPA, through CDBG, I mean, we, the town supports housing with you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to preserve or create or um, you know, even services for housing. And so, but the town doesn't own housing. So if we owned you know, an apartment building of hundred units, yeah, we might have a campaign or we might have a budget line item to support that every year, but the town isn't a landlord. We're not the housing authority. And so, you know, if we see like something about the library or the schools or public works, those are town facilities, but the town isn't really a landlord in that respect in terms of housing. So it's a little, it is a little different. Thank you, Nate. And just a reminder, there's also the listening session that will help us uh, develop this five-year strategic plan, which I, uh, I think if we can commit to having it done by December 2023, it'll really be very helpful and give us some sort of guidance of where we want to go to and list priorities, um, which would respond to some of the um, issues that uh, Ashley raised, as well as Grover. So I'd like to recognize Eliza. It's actually Elisa, but you can't tell by looking at the spelling. Sorry, Elisa. Okay. Anyway, I raised my hand about a totally different source of funding, and that's ARPA, because it suddenly occurred to me to wonder whether that's part of the unallocated, I'm making air quotes and you can't see it. Anyway, the unallocated COVID funds that the Republicans in Congress are trying to take back. Is it? Do we know? Yeah, so the town has allocated, um, I don't know exactly the amount, a significant amount of funds, ARPA funds for affordable housing. Um, right. And we are we are very protective of, of it and we're making sure we're, you know, we're paying close attention so that they don't claw back the unspent funds. So, right. um, so yeah, we're alert to that and yeah. have strategy available to us if that, well. if that seems to be moving. Yeah, I figured that right. you would try to prevent them from clawing it back. I just don't know. Absolutely. You know right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carol, um, do we want to move towards announcements beyond, I think we already started with the joint CRC meeting. Yes, we did talk about, I did talk about that, but only I have a couple, three other announcements. One is Coming up in June, Wednesday the 14th and Thursday the 15th, Mass Housing Partnership, MHP, is having its Housing Institute. Um, one of the days is, by, is virtual and the other day is in Zoom. Nate sent out um, a mem um, email with registration information. So it will be a really great chance to discover more about what kinds of supports are out there for whatever kind of housing we want to try to do. Um, there is a round, I don't, I don't really know, uh, Mindy Dom is bringing the, the house chair of the joint House committee on housing to a round table next, next Friday from 10 to 12 that various of us have been invited to Erica and I have been invited. I don't, it came at, I don't know who's invited because that wasn't part of the information, but I know that there will be some town council members there. I know we will be there. So I guess if anyone has something that they would like, that they would like us to consider or have in our head or in our back pocket, Erica and I, when we go to this meeting, which will be about housing, uh, email us what you what you have. I don't have any idea whether it's how open or how closed it is. I don't know the answer to that. Um, um, what else? The other, though, the one other thing is we're coming up on the time when Eric and I have been doing this for a year and uh, we, it's our year anniversary or something. So anyway, we get to re up, we appoint, re choose, coach. 
a chair or co-chairs either. So if somebody else is interested in stepping into this role, uh, now's your chance or within the next couple months anyway. So um, we'll have that, the officialness of it will be on a future agenda, but it's something to think about at the moment. And I think we have successfully done, as we usually do, um, public comments as we have gone along. I don't think we have anything that wasn't anticipated in 48 hours. It isn't still unanticipated, at least by me. I don't know of anything else. Uh, so our next meeting is Thursday, June 8th, our next regular meeting, although it is also a housing trust meeting, the one that's a joint trust and CRC meeting, that's next Thursday at our usual time. Risha. I, I just wanted, I have two suggestions for future guests, and I had emailed one, but I didn't get a response that said, yes, we'll ask them, or so I don't know if I should bring them up at the meeting. Uh, so one I did not talk about, and that is um, I'd be interested in hearing from the groups that are organizing for affordable housing at UMass, the student groups and the advocates. Um, yeah. So I think we heard from the administration, but I'd, I'd also like to hear how we could ally with them. Um, and then the second is um, in the spirit of thinking about new ideas um, in the tiny houses of last month. Um, I have been long thinking about uh, sort of senior co-housing, that's not the right word, but sh house shares and, and facilitating house shares to put people in houses that seniors are in but need help maintaining either financially or otherwise. Um, and there's a lot of uh, versions of that around the country. And I'm wondering if if someone, if, if people are interested, I'm happy to try to reach out and make an invite. I don't know them, but I, I'm happy to make that connection. I, I think that's great, but also Treehouse in East Hampton is um, a kind of that, and that's Wayfinders, and that is independent people who are oftentimes fostering kids, but then also have their own place. It's it's a version of that, but I don't know. I mean, there's lots of versions, but Wayfinders does one version of that. Great. Okay. Um, I don't... I. I would be interested in, in hearing from somebody about that thing where seniors have maybe a college student, maybe it puts those two things together or something or other. So seniors get help financially and maybe with other things that they need and the person gets someplace to live. I'd be interested in that. I could, we just have a quick uh, kind of, are other people interested in that hearing about that? Just a thumbs thingy. I got at least one, two, I got three thumbs, four, I can't tell. Three or four thumbs up. So I think that that's not exactly a quorum, but somehow I think you could find out a little more if you want to reach it, that would be great. I make it the quorum, so sure. All righty, great. <laughs> And, and I really want to um, also just to agree that uh, any innovative and informative presentations that give us ideas about where we should go to and think about, you know, new initiatives is for me very welcomed. Could we start talking to other towns, for instance, that give a incentive in mortgages like Holyoke and also Chicopee and well, Mindy Dom has Grand B. I don't, I'm not sure what they do, but they give $5,000 if you live in their town for 10 years. Like there's lots of towns doing innovative things to help people buy. And many are doing innovative things to help people rent. Let's start looking around and seeing why, like what we can do to help people rent and help people buy with town money. Um. Like Maybe. Chicopee or Holyoke does. Nate? Sure, yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure. Um, Misha, I was gonna say that the Senior Center is also uh, doing the Age and Dementia Friendly Project with PVPC. I'd read out to Haley Bolton, the Director of Senior Services. You know, housing was identified as a, one of the highest priorities um, in terms of aging in place or transitional housing for seniors. And so I know that they're wrapping up that project, but. You know, housing was a really big piece that, that was 
you know, identified. And so they may have already looked into that in terms of their, that, that project, that initiative. So if you reached out to, to Haley, she might be able to um, let you know. Um, and then just quickly for Ashley's point, we, the town does support uh, home ownership and rental quite a bit. Uh, there's, you know, the anti-aid amendment through the state. So it's difficult in terms of giving money directly to, to individuals, uh, but through CPA, CDBG and other funding, we have, you'll see it. So um, when one of the documents that will be sent out for next week, you'll see certain programs that'll be funded. So we've funded first time home buyer programs. We've put in probably a million dollars in the last five years into rental subsidy programs. And so there's a lot of money that goes into it um, already. There could be other programs. I think what Valley CDC has identified is that the cost of home ownership is something that $5,000 may not be sufficient. So when they look for home ownership assistance, I mean, it's in the range of 50,000. You know, the Amherst Community Land Trust is doing it with, they look for even more money to help someone actually, you know, be able to afford to get into a home in Amherst. So there are programs that are available. There is, you know, um, first time home buyer programs right now looking for people that, you know, there's money available for that. And so that's been ongoing pretty consistently for the last five or six years uh, through different organizations at the town. You know, the town may not be running it, but we help support them. And so it may not be known, right? People may not know that we're supporting Valley uh, in their home ownership program. And, you know, maybe we have to do a better job advertising that, but, you know, we're, we're behind that, uh, you know, we're helping with that, you know, we're, so it's not as if, you know, if someone comes to the town and has these ideas, I think it's great. So uh, it's something that then it could become a proposal for funding or something uh, in the future, but. Okay, it just it just looks like when you see Tikopi government, like the the website, it says like more or less a five thousand dollar help for your mortgage, and so, so I, somewhere I mean, somewhere they got funding for that, and so yeah. I I would like to I would like to find a way to move on. Yes, we should be looking try to find any innovative things that we can find. I agree, and that's an interesting one. Um, oh, I'd like to add to a list of a guest that I would like to invite. I would like to invite Rob. I would, or it doesn't have to be you, Rob. I would like to sometime hear more about Amherst Community Land Trust as a, as a home ownership. I know it's like one home at a time, but I also know that it gets people into homes and I, I'd love it if we heard more about it sometime, so. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about it for a while, sure. Great. So beside uh, two meetings coming up, we have now also got some things to put on our list of things that we'd like to hear about. Is there anything else anybody wants to say any before we go? I would um then is there any objection to adjourning that's probably not the right way to adjourn, to do that but can we adjourn can we have a thumbs up thingy for adjourning all in favor signify by doing something like this uh thank you all very much for being here and i'll see you hopefully next week on the 18th after reading lots of stuff thank you everyone thank you grover and welcome thanks yeah